it is always so fun for me to hear the little automated voice recording in progress. It's just a fun time. Yeah. Okay, so thank you everyone for being here. We are currently just letting people um, connect to the audio and connect to, you know, when Zoom comes in, it takes a while for them to, you know, link up. So I'll start in about 30 seconds. You can just hang in there. But in the meanwhile, I would like to direct your attention to Victor's background, which I believe is the um, cover of one edition of his book as well. First one, yes. First edition. It's so nice. It's by a local artist, right? Sunny Liu, mm -hmm. the Eisner Award-winning author of uh, Charlie Chan, Hok Chai. Um, it is also the illustration that inspired the, the piece that I'm reading. Oh, all right. Yeah, let so me move out so you can see it. See? Yeah. yeah, that's yeah. what I was thinking of. I was like, that looks so familiar, but I, I feel like there was a spaceman in the middle and that explains it. You are the spaceman right now. Uh, right, right now, yes. <laughs> okay, you know what? I can see that like most people have connected and we're just going to begin. And then when people come, you know, if they miss the start, you know, they should have just been on time. Anyway, hello everyone. And thank you so much for joining us today as we celebrate the North American launch of Victor Fernando R. Ocampo's The Infinite Library and Other Stories, published by Gaudy Boy. My name is Jemima and I'm your host for tonight. Tonight, we are going to be hearing from the winners of the Gaudy Boy Flash Fiction Contest, judged by the wonderful Monique Trong. Victor will also be reading a story and apologize only for this North American edition. And then we're gonna chat a little bit and then open the floor to Q and A's. So if you have any burning questions, please put them in the chat box and we'll keep an eye on them and the moderators will also fill them to us. But before we begin, I really wanna invite G to say a few words. G Leon Ko is the publisher and editor in chief of Gaudy Boy, a New York City based literary press that publishes vital Asian voices from around the world. Gaudy Boy publishes poetry, fiction and literary nonfiction it also publishes works both in English and in translation. So G, please. Thank you so much, Jemima. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. Good evening. My name is uh, G Leon Ko. I'm the publisher and the editor in chief of Gaudy Boy, a New York City based literary press publishing Asian voices from around the world. Thank you so much for joining us this evening for the US launch of the Infinite Library and Other Stories by Victor Fernando R. Ocampo. I'm sure that, you know, all over the world, we have been suffering from isolation from one another and quarantine. And it's so nice to be able to actually connect with everybody in this way. And that's really very much a part of the mission of Body Boy to actually connect readers and writers, right, over Asian literature. I want to thank you, uh, Jemima Wei, for actually hosting this event. She was such a live wire when she hosted the uh, launch of uh, Monique Trong's uh, The Sweetest Fruits that we thought we have to have her back again uh, because not only is she so enthusiastic and passionate about literature, but she's so intellectually probing and searching uh, when she asks uh, uh, authors questions. So, <laughs> so, you know, expect, you know, not a kind of run of the mill kind of discussion coming up, but a really wide ranging uh, uh, engagement and discussion uh, with the author uh, tonight. Uh, we are also so pleased and honored that uh, the novelist uh, Monique Trong is joining us uh, tonight as well. Uh, we are so honored to actually call her a gaudy boy author after we've actually published a Singapore and Malaysian edition of her latest novel, The Sweetest Fruits, which was actually launched uh, earlier this year. Uh, Moni Trong so kindly agreed to judge the Singapore Unbound's first flash fiction contest, uh, which was based on the theme of Victor's book, The Infinite Library. And I believe uh, she will, in a little while, say a few words about her experience judging this contest. Thank you so much, Monique, for actually being part of this event. Uh, we will also, of course, hear from the winners of the first Flash Fiction Contest. And I have read them again and again and find new things in them. It's amazing how much can be packed into just 100 words. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to hearing our winners as well. Right, a personal uh, uh, note, you know, uh, personal, some personal words for uh, Victor, the, uh, the man of the hour, so to speak. I first met uh, Victor in Singapore over dim sum. And that was after I actually read <laughs> his collection of speculative fiction, uh, The Infinite Library and Other Stories. It was completely blown away by this. I mean, 
Uh, Victor is Filipino. He's actually based in Singapore. So when I travel back to Singapore, you know, I thought I have to meet the man. So we had dim sum and I discovered in Victor uh, an enormous but very discerning appetite, not just for food, but also for ideas. And that's actually what I think you will find in the Infinite Library. All right, it is just so full of characters and situations and plots and ideas. It's really, really quite mind boggling. To call it the Infinite Library is actually not a misnomer. I also want to thank, uh, before I go, um, my, you know, uh, the Gordy Boy team for actually putting out, you know, uh, this title and other titles this year. Uh, especially uh, appreciative of uh, my managing editor, Kimberly Lim, who is managing all the highlighting, you know, during this uh, event. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kimberly. And of course, the rest of the team, uh, the assistant editor, Judy Luo, the uh, uh, editorial intern, Leticia Kyok, our publicity intern, Isabel Drake, and our social media uh, manager, Emily Von Bostel. Uh, these are the people who really, really, you know, you know get everything going. Uh, and make things happen. Uh, finally, I want to say a big thank you to our uh, designer of uh, this uh, American edition, uh, the cover, the cover designer of this American edition of the Infinite Library. She's of course Flora Chan, and I believe I saw her coming in uh, to this meeting and joining us. So she's here. So I hope you will hear from me, uh, Flora, from all of us at Body Boy, how much we appreciate your stupendous, brilliant work designing the cover, not just for uh, the Infinite Library, but for all our Body Boy titles as well. Thank you so much uh, for your creativity and brilliance. Back to you, Gemma. Gemma. Thank you, G. And that is actually my first time hearing the story of how you met Victor. So I hope that if there are any aspiring writers in the audience, you can take encouragement in knowing you can actually DM authors and writers are friendly. They're not just mm. Quietly, you know, not hanging out with other people, they, they will meet you and get to know you and, you know, you might see like a wonderful book launch as a result of it. Now, it brings me great pleasure to introduce Monique Trong, the judge for Gaudy Boy's recent flash fiction contest. Monique Trong is the author of best-selling novels, The Book of Salt, Bitter in the Mouth, and The Sweetest Fruits, which we had a delicious launch for when it was released in Southeast Asia a couple of months ago. Her essays have appeared in the New York Times, Washington Post, and the Wall Street Journal, amongst others. Monique is also a lyricist and librettist working in collaboration with composers Joan LaBarbera and Shuhei Chen, recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship, U.S. Japan Creative Artist Fellowship, and Hutter Fellowship. She has taught fiction writing at Columbia School of the Arts, where we met, Princeton and Baruch College as a Sydney Harmon Writer-in-Residence. Her latest honor is being named finalist of the 2021 John Dos Passos Prize for Literature. Monique, would you say a few words about judging the contest? Yes. First, it's a pleasure to see you um, all. 100%. <laughs> um, uh, let me just say a hearty congratulations to Victor Fernando Campo on the publication of the Infinite Library um, and other stories. It's, it's just a pleasure to um, be a part of your celebration tonight. And I want to thank uh, G and the Gaudi Boy team for asking me to judge this uh, flash fiction contest, which took as its theme Ocampo's evocative title, the Infinite Library. Um, like I said, it's an honor. It, and it's, it's also quite a responsibility to be asked to weigh in on another writer's work. Um, and um, I, I have to say that I, I adore these pieces of flash fiction. Uh, for the same reasons that I adore uh, works of fiction um, uh, of much longer length, <laughs> um, meaning that these works um, ask more questions than uh, they provide answers for. I love that. Works that create uh, 
open-ended, suggestive uh, narrative possibilities. And also, you know, apropos of the genre, works that um, make every single word matter. And um, so before I share with you my flash comments and commendations for the pieces, um, I wanna leave you with this, um, which gives me hope and hopefully same for you, that all libraries are in theory infinite because human imagination is infinite. Um, and that's exciting. <laughs> <laughs> so I will begin with the honorable mention uh, and um, which went to a piece called, uh, and I love this, it's the first time I've said this word on Zoom or anywhere else, How Fucky Am I to Be Loved <laughs> by Eric <laughs> Tan Shen Yell. And for that piece, I wrote existential coupledom seen through the prism of humor and heart pangs. Uh, third prize went to a piece called Devotion by Shu Qi. And that is a trenchant, evocative snapshot of how faith feeds us, but in differing ways. Second prize went to This is a Nice Hotel by Olivia Giawato, um, whose narrator's scathing jaded eye for telltale details, belies a continuing belief in what may be. And then first prize, finally, first prize went to a piece called A Room with a Point of View by Mastura Alatas, which was such a sly litmus test of the reader's assumptions. Is the reference Ananda a trickster, an avenger, or ignorant? And I turn it over to our authors to read their work. Yeah. Wow. I want to, you know, attend every single launch when Monique judged something because what wonderful. <laughs> thoughtful and meaningful like ways of engaging with the text. That is such an honor for any writer. So now we are going to hear from the winners of the contest. First up, we have Eric Tan, who was awarded honorable mention. Eric Tan's poems have appeared in the Hawaii Review, Singho Remo, Rattle, and elsewhere. He has received three awards from the National Poetry Pop Festival, including first prize for English poetry, as well as a Golden Point Award in English poetry third prize from the National Arts Council. He is looking forward to his retirement, which he envisions as an iteration of reading, writing, gardening, cooking, and napping. So Eric, over to you. I'm really looking forward to listen to How Fucky Am I To Be Loved. <laughs> uh, okay, hello. I actually don't really use vulgarities, but uh, for this piece, it was in the title. Um, so I shall read now. How Fucky Am I To Be Loved? My alarm rings with applause, as should yours the recognition we deserve at 5.45. The cat needs to be fed and orchids watered. I need to lose weight. You said you cheated because I needed trauma for my character development. Thank you, I said, thank you. I could thank anything. Above the toilet seat, I gave birth to a moth which flew out from between my legs. Didn't ask why, for whys are infinite. For example, why? Why are we? I contain absurdities and don't even know if my washer and dryer are actual friends or just work friends. Thank you. Um, thank you, Eric. <laughs> so now we have third prize winner, Xu Qi, up next. Xu Qi is, a 30, is 37 years old and a resident of Singapore. She moved just last year from India she writes and publishes poetry on medium.com. She also writes personal essays, short stories, and children's literature. And working on her novel keeps her busy. She has taken to writing full-time just recently, but earlier she was a software engineer with a degree in marketing. So Devotion by Xu Qi. Hello, everyone. Yes, Devotion. 
Raja's young hungry eyes were staring at a pair of white and blue slippers. They were left by some devotee outside the holy premise of the grand old Ganesh temple. From hundreds of pairs of footwear, shoes, sandals, and more of various sizes, colors, shapes, belonging to the temple's unending varied throng, he would steal the newest looking. They would fetch the best price. The mob was still there, still inside at the auspicious hour, making offerings to the idol, chanting and tolling bells. He put on the slippers, hastily walked out, hid the slippers and returned for more, as always. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Shuchi. That was lovely. Um, next up, we have Olivia. I am so excited because when they asked me to host this, I was very pleasantly surprised to see my old schoolmate on the list. Olivia won second prize for her flash piece, This is a Nice Hotel. So Olivia Jawoto works in the literary arts in Singapore and occasionally finds time to write. The few things she has published includes essay, essays in moving worlds, short fiction in transport art, and photography in high shelf press. Olivia, the stage is all yours. Thanks, Jemima. And it's so good to be able to see you online like this as well. <laughs> um, so this is my piece um, called This is a Nice Hotel. Grabbing 602 off the wall, the other keys dangled in asynchronous motion. I love the catch of using keys instead of key cards, the same way people enjoyed checking out their own groceries. The illusion of self-made order. 602 was a middle-aged couple with the typical signs of wear and tear. Cat scratches on one, but not the other. Separate bags, different wake-up calls. They were an open book. 602 barely made it into the lift before arguing. As another pair of guests walked through the door, I dated the entry in my notebook and turned to a fresh page. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, now for the first prize winner, Masura Alatas, a room with a point of view. Masura Alatas is a Singapore-born writer who currently lives in Italy. She is the author of The Girl Who Made It Snow in Singapore, published in 2008, and The Life in the Writing in 2010. She is one of several writers, along with Naomi Klein and Amitabh Ghosh, to be published in Will the Flower Slip Through the Ash Pulp, Writers Respond to Climate Change, the 2017 anthology. Her short fiction has been long listed for the Lingua Madre and Cambridge Short Story Prices. So, looking forward to hearing A Room with a Point of View. Thank you for the introduction. Um, can everybody hear me clearly? Yes? Yeah. Okay, great. And uh, congratulations to um, all winning, all winners. It was very lovely to hear all your winning stories. Right, and this is mine, A Room with a point of view. Sometimes Ananda would do odd jobs for us for extra money to send home to Sri Lanka. Once we set him the task of dusting the books in the library. We went off to the Sibilini mountains for the day. He had the whole house to himself. Don't worry if you jumble up the books, I told him. When we returned, Ananda had already left. The hundreds of books were all in place but reversed, spines at the back, four edges in full view. Gone were the visible titles, gone was our entitlement to infinite knowledge. Thank you. Yow! <laughs> gone was our entitlement to infinite knowledge. Okay, <laughs> thank you so much, Masura, and thank you all readers. You know, I read a delicious description of Flex flash fiction in the margins, where they kind of compare it to an instant pot, with a kind, which is a kind of pressure cooker, where flash fiction has so much tension to release. And I think hearing all our winners read tonight, that's really true. But without further ado, I want to bring Victor on stage for this highly anticipated reading from his collection. Victor Fernando Aro Ocampo is the author of the International Rubri Book Award shortlist, the collection, The Infinite Library, and Other Stories. He is a fellow at the Milford Science Fiction Writers Conference in the UK and the Sini Malaya Ricky Lee Film Script Writing Workshop in the Philippines, as well as a Jalan Basar Writer-in-Residence at Singlet Station in Singapore. 
originally from the Philippines, Victor currently resides in Singapore. And it is my great pleasure to invite him now to read from his new book. Victor, please. Thank you so much. Uh, this is actually quite an honor also to be part of the Gaudi Boy family. You've published some of the nicest works that, that, that I've read in a long time. Uh, I, I'm here uh, with a background made by Sunny Liu, uh, the Eisner Award-winning uh, Malaysian Singapore artist uh, of Charlie, uh, the art of Charlie Chan Hock Chai. And as you can see, there's an astronaut behind me. This is actually uh, quite funny. Uh, he was inspired to create this work uh, for the cover. Uh, of my book because he read the stories. And I in turn got inspired by the artwork to write the piece of flash fiction that I will be reading to you called uh, To See Infinity Inside the Pages of a Book. So without further ado, let me, let me, let me read this for you. Millennia into the future, there is an exhibit simultaneously present in the museums of Cebu, Rome, Singapore, in every city state that is still in existence. For the bargain price of one year removed from your lifespan, you can view a special exhibit and glimpse infinity with your very own eyes. There is a crack in space and time so finite that the naked eye cannot see it without using special camera obscure. Past the darkness of the aperture is the image of a hole in the universe where an ancient astronaut origin unknown, appears to be endlessly falling. Is the astronaut a man, a woman, or perhaps something else? Is the astronaut old or young? Where did the astronaut come from? No one knows, at least not anymore. The only thing that learned men and experts seem to agree upon is this, because of how time dilates in space travel, the astronaut must already be dead but the experts and learned men are wrong. On top of every wall where the interstellar camera obscure project enigmatic images, there is an old bronze sign that reads, the universe is a book. Those who do not read cannot travel beyond the limits of their borders. The original one can still be found in the Museum of Manila. According to local legend, this sign was gifted by a disgraced archivist astronomer from Quiapo. One day when she was running a camera obscure, a star in the galactic neighborhood went nova. The image shifted momentarily and she noticed that the astronaut was in fact holding a book. Moreover, the astronaut was not actually falling in space but rather moving through what appeared to be an impossibly infinite library. Beyond the valley of the shadow of death, she heard a fugitive antiphon and for the briefest of instants, her soul began to sing. But the image shifted back swiftly, too fast for her to record it. The joyful song also disappeared. When the archivist astronomer made a report, she was branded a charlatan and dismissed. The poor woman became a beggar on the streets of Manila, disgraced but nurturing the righteous, uh, righteous hope like a talisman. From the shadows of the city, she implored all those she came across for a small coin of time, exchanging life for a passage from the books of Zeno of Alea. After many an importune year, the worm turned in her favor, and she collected enough to pay for the camera obscure signs that hang in every gallery uh, and museum today. This is what the archivist astronomer saw. Inside the singularity, the impossible astronaut is not dead. They are reading. Before they get to the last book they will ever read in their life, there is yet another book that needs to be read. Between that penultimate book and the one they hold in their hand, there is yet another book and another demanding attention. In fact, between the astronaut and death, there is an endless series of books with no beginning and no end. The astronaut and the disgraced astronomer archivist had discovered one of the greatest secrets of the universe that those who fall endlessly into books never die. They are forever reading. That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Victor. From that short reading, I got so much already and I really feel like it represents and wraps up so neatly your, your collection. So for those of you who don't have the book yet, the link to purchase it is in the chat box. 
but you know this is the last piece in the collection and it's so great i got so much already it shows your questioning of traditional structures of knowledge the excitement of possibility and myth and it already showcases the fluidity of labels that we still cling to in the real world I, I love it. But I wanted to first start off our conversation from a point of excitement, which I always feel is as good a place to start as any. So I just wanted to tell you that when I told some of my girlfriends here in New York that I was hosting this launch, they were so excited and so hopeful to hear about a Filipino writer writing speculative fiction on the world stage. So let's begin by talking about that. Your writing is so inventive and so beautiful and Filipino identity is so strongly encoded in the DNA of your prose. So what has writing into a canon that has been so traditionally white been like for you? Oh, it's very good. Um, the writer Ken Liu actually visited Singapore when I was just starting out. And basically somebody in the audience asked him, can somebody in Southeast Asia actually publish in the West? At that time, there were, uh, Southeast Asian speculative fiction was virtually unknown. Uh, this must have been in the late, you know, sorry, the, the early 2010s and something like that. And it was just beginning to come out in, 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 in public, in places ever. And he said that, yes, it is possible, but we have to try really hard because the center is at the West and we have to create more centers uh, for this to become more, uh, um, more open to everybody and all the writers around the world. And uh, yeah, he was basically, uh, he went on to talk about uh, how difficult it was to, to get in for an Asian writer at that time. But it's even more difficult because at least he was based in the US. But for us, it, to just get a piece reviewed, people will think about uh, who is this person? And also the the reference that, that we have are not familiar to people. So uh, it's, it's very difficult, but then he was right. You just have to keep on submitting. You have to, there, there may be differences between our cultures, but I think the universal humanity of everyone makes it, um, makes works that are not from the center worth reading. And it's actually in this world where everything is so different. It is these similarities that we actually need to celebrate. And this is most especially true for speculative fiction, whose world is weird and strange to begin with. And hanging on to that familiarity is actually very important. I think that's so, I, I love Ken Liu, just straight yeah. up love him. Um, I think that is so true because you know what you were saying about, you know, it's so difficult writing from outside the center. Well, in speculative fiction, who says you need to have a center? You can have yes, multiple absolutely. centers. You create the world that you want to live in. I also really resonated with what you said about, you know, voting on the similarities as opposed to differences, because I also grew up in Singapore and the vocabulary I learned, I used to articulate what I experienced, came from writers from all over the world who did not have the same experience as me. Mm -hmm. And I'm so sure that your work is going to do that for some writer somewhere in a different corner of the world. So I'm, I'm so excited that you're being published in like in North America with a body boy. So Thank the you. topic, of, yeah, the topic of identity, you know, um, as a writer, as a Southeast Asian writer, I think comes out so clearly in your work because you encode so many Filipino myths into your work, and we can talk about that later. But I just also really wanted to talk about how you construct like social possibility within your fictional worlds. In this last week, um, we've been having this conversation a lot on Twitter. It seems that the expectation is that when you are from the periphery, your work has to be about the periphery. And sometimes readers take up issue with the, with the plausibility of work that doesn't jive with their own lived experience, even if this story is set in reality. And on top of that, you are working with realities that are speculative, that are set in alternate universes. So when constructing a speculative world and being conscious of the social possibility within those fictional worlds, how do you find managing that balance when working with spec fic as opposed to street realism? Oh, that's a very good question. And I will be very, very honest with you. When I write a story, I don't usually set out um, to write it in a particular genre. I uh, I like to experiment with form, with trope, as well as content. And normally I write it and 
it just happens. Uh, it, 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 this is a speculative fiction story. This is a real story. This is something that I don't know how to define this kind of story. It, it just happens. But the reason why I gravitate towards speculative fiction is it's very, the, the, it, it calls for experimentation. And it call, it, it, we're able to push the limits. We live in a box of literature. And speculative fiction is one of those boxes where it's so good to push the boundaries of everything you can test things you can there are things like there are in some countries there are places where you can't speak out out uh, out loud or you cannot write something out in a certain way otherwise you get the government writing you or something like that and speculative fiction is one way for us to basically speak the truth uh, but veiled in uh, in words so to speak so uh, you don't get in trouble but still you get your point across I actually really sense that um, excitement about playing with form and I was going to bring it up a bit later into our conversation, but since you bring it up, I'm going to just go with that. So, um, you know, in your stories, the playing with form is so, you know, evident in all the different ways you approach literature. So you have the story, I am the one in 10, and you actually write in a language that's altered and which when I'm reading it, it, I feel like it almost alters the way my mind processes the text. And then in the first story, um, just tell me if I'm pronouncing it right, okay? Mene Thiesel Ferris? Mene Thiesel Ferris, it's, it's uh, yeah, it's Hebrew. Oh, yes, I don't speak Hebrew, but thank you for letting me <laughs> pronounce that. So in that story, reality and documents intrude in the cool tone of the text. So you have the story, but you also have these like snippets from outside the story, and then it ends in possibility. Oh, almost like a choose the choose your own adventure story, which was such an exciting like movement in form for me. And then you have another story, an excerpt from the Philippine Journal of Archaeology. It takes on the language of reportage. So I get the sense that playing with form for you is almost just as exciting as playing with content in your work. And even though you said that when you write, it just happens, I would love to hear more about how you structurally, um, it, how, how that process goes for you, you know, like when you're writing a story, does form follow the content or, or do you kind of tie those two together in the editing process? Like, let's hear it. Oh, uh, again, that's a very good question. Um, usually for, with the exception of two of those stories that you mentioned, uh, mm -hmm. it starts with the content. I have an idea, I write it out. And then uh, the form, the form basically comes to me while I'm while I'm writing. It's just like most writers; you don't know whether this is going to end up as a short story or it's going to end up as a novella or a novel. And in in a certain way, what you write dictates how it's going to be. But for I am the one in ten, and for the uh, and for the journal entry like one, the excerpt from a, a journal Philippine Archaeology, that was actually the flip the flip thing was the opposite. I was. For, for the journal entry, I was thinking, is it possible to actually write a story in the footnotes and not in the actual text? That was basically, it was a challenge I had to myself. Is it possible to write something that some people will find compelling and yet the story doesn't actually appear in the main, in the main well, it's not a narrative, but in the main uh, the body of the text so that and it was that challenge that made me made me write that story and uh, up to you to judge whether it was successful or not but with the uh with the i'm the one in ten it uh i work in the technology spaces in my day job and uh, i used to be uh i don't know if some of you are old enough to remember yahoo but uh my Yahoo yeah, Messenger. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yahoo Messenger was my product. And it always amazed me to see how people kept on shortening and shortening and shortening their messages that were there. And I was thinking, I oh, hear in a, if you I write a science fiction story, um, uh, and I want it to be about the near future, why can't I actually uh, give them that give them a language that's actually from the future that I know? Is, uh, is already starting to be spoken today. And, and the orthography of language is such that it's been shortened and we say lol instead of laugh out loud now and everything has been compressed. And I was thinking, you know, when you're in the future, one or, or when you think about the future, there is this 
uncomfortableness, this uh, this unfamiliarity that's there. And I think that language beautifully conveys this. If you are able to make something it's like Shakespeare to us is basically uh, uh, like that. When you read it to them, that was everyday vernacular language. To us, it's actually a special thing that many people struggle with. And the reverse should be true for the future. They might be speaking something that is actually almost intelligible for us, and yet it's not there. And one of my friends said, you know, the only way to really read your story is to read it out loud. That is the easiest way to read it. Yeah. And I go, yeah, you know, you're right. And mostly because it, 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 is, it, it is easy for us to understand spoken languages. And in, in a sense, that story is actually meant to be told rather than read. Yeah. yeah. So I'm going to respond to, I want to talk more about that story, I am the one in 10, but I'm just going to very quickly respond to what you said earlier about having a story in the footnotes. I feel like, um, obviously, this is very much part of your work as a writer, but for me, I just like, kind of made that connection that it's so similar to like on a meta level to what you're doing as a specific writer, you are writing kind of like not, you know, when earlier you said, you know, you write in spec fic so that you don't have to directly, you know, people get the point, but it's a speculative fiction. It's like kind of like a, a separate language. And when you say it, like when you're working with that form of telling a story without telling a story, um, that kind of like rang certain bells in my mind. So that was very exciting for me. So that's just a footnote. And going back to IMD 1 in 10, I, I wanted to ask you about the process of writing, of creating that language. So for those of you who haven't read the story, it's told in, um, where certain letters are replaced with numbers and um, symbols. And you know, if you're reading it, you're letting your brain naturally like read it. You can understand what it's saying, but if you focus too hard on every individual word, sometimes you get a little bit like, oh, you know, I'm trying to figure out, I'm trying to decode it. But I realized that when I first read the story, um, I was trying too hard to come to it as a, as a serious reader. And then when I took a step back and let the story bring me along, um, everything flowed. So I can't even, even be, I can't even imagine how difficult it was. Did you have to create like a like a side key of the languages? You know, how did that work for you? Oh, here's the scary part. None of the words that are invented. And the grammar rules are also not invented. Oh. Yeah, I, I used lead speak and SMS and, and, and messaging. Uh, what's, what's uh, vocabulary. Lead speak is basically uh, the, the clipped speech that people have when they're uh, do it going online. So programmers use it a lot, gamers use it a lot. LOL is an example, for example, LOL. And the, these, are the, these, the, these are basically shortcuts to language that, that people have that over time become part of our language like lol is the most is the most common one as i use it all the time lol but uh the other one that i most uh i put there and this i really enjoyed doing this there is a filipino subculture called jejemon it is used by uh young people from lower the lower economic bracket and it is something that many filipinos of a certain uh yeah, of a certain educational attainment actually frown upon. They don't like it because, you know, poor people use it. And I really hate that. So basically I said, what if I write a high concept story where this becomes actually the center of it? And I've had lots of people actually read it and they didn't realize that, hey, look, you're reading Jejemon. And, and the, the weird spelling uh, the weird spelling in some of the words there is actually, I had to deconstruct Jejemon to get the grammar rules. And then I applied it to here. It is not unique to me. It is an actual thing that people are using in the Philippines. I love that. I love that I learned this like right now. Okay, wait. So I'm going to respond to that. But I also want to say that I'm sure if I have like all these questions just popping up in my head, so does everyone in the audience. So please, if you have questions for Victor, put it in the chat so I can get to it, you know, before the end of the session. I really want to make sure everybody who has questions for him has the opportunity to ask them. But okay. Back to our conversation, I really love that you brought it up because we have something very similar in Singapore where there is a prioritization of proper English um, and, you know, people feel a certain way about, you know, speaking Singlish. Um, mm -hmm. It's seen as more colloquial. I mean, I mean, I think this debate repeats itself all over the world where the colloquial language, that kind of um, the, the adaptation that moves away from traditional Queen's English or American standardized English is seen as not just 
not the correct English, but the you know less lesser English. And I think sometimes this is something that we take on on ourselves as well. There is a certain self criticization. Criticization, lol. That's not a word. Ah, I just said lol. <laughs> um, self critique <laughs> that is like almost ingrained into us when we grow up. You know, as we learn to speak. So did you? Have any like experience like that growing up? You know, did you did you have to struggle? You know, with with like your, you know, the kind of English that you speak. I okay, so I've 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 lived for a long and short periods in six countries, and I have become used to accents and used to local terminologies over time. As a matter of fact, part of my work is translating English to English. If you have a Brazilian team that is doing your software development and you're speaking to a Scottish boss and a Vietnamese client, you tend to, to pick this up very quickly. But one of the things that I've learned ever since I was a kid was that all of these ways of speaking, whether they're highbrow or lowbrow, they're considered, they actually represent points of views. And it's very important that, that, that we know this worldview. This is to me a treasure. Singlish that you mentioned, I think is one of the unheralded national treasures of Singapore. It, I, there are words and concepts in Singlish that don't exist anywhere else. And, and I, I use these in my work. Uh, one of the stories there is actually written partly in Singlish, uh, big enough for the entire universe. I uh, love that story. Yeah. Oh, we'll talk about that later. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Go on. No, no worries. But I, I, I think that it's important that people, people see this, people learn it, that it exists in the first place, and also to understand that that there is a reason that, th that these words are used. There's a reason that these things came about. And there is an entire world hidden here that is just waiting for us to discover it. It's in the language, yeah. When you were saying, when you know when earlier I was telling you that when I read your story, I am the one in 10, I felt like my brain was being altered by that. Um, now when you're saying that listening to the different variations of English is a window into the worlds of those people speaking it, that just makes so much sense. And that's like actually a very beautiful way of putting it. I am glad that this session is recorded because I'm going to go back, listen to it and take notes. Um, but you know, since you brought it up about the ways you've worked in many, many different countries, um, I wanted to talk about balance also as a Filipino writer based in Singapore, you have your feet planted firmly between two cultures. And it seems even more than that because your, your experience is so varied. So how do you decode the differences between existing physically and emotionally emotionally in two places in your life and in your work? It is, I think, very, uh, it's very obvious in, in, in many of my stories that I write from the perspective of diaspora. I am neither mm. here nor there, and that adds a level of liminality in the work that I have. It is always in between places. And actually, uh, the Filipino diaspora is very large, but the amount of actual writing uh, of any kind, and I'm not even speculative fiction, is very small. There are more Filipino writers writing in the Philippines or in the places that they've adopted as their homes. There is, for example, a, 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 a fairly large number of Filipino-American writers whose work is starting to get, uh, to, uh, to get known right now. Uh, but they're not part of the diaspora per se because they have a lived experience in the U.S. that, that, that is unique to them. I have no roots in that regard. I write in Singapore, but I've lived in so many places. My work makes me travel all the time, at least before COVID came. And so it is something that I would like to share, that rootlessness uh, it, that I think everybody feels at least some part of their life. They have it already in this conversation. Uh, there, are, there are a few people who have actually already read who are also at least have part of that, share part of that experience with me. It's there. It just—it's a small but growing body, and I, I, I will, I, and it's something that I'm happy to be a part of uh, as a writer. I think that's so true. I really do see um, when you were saying earlier, you know, um, a lot of Filipino writers, Filipino American writers coming up. I have definitely seen that. I actually just received a proof from um, Prof. State for Brown Girls by Daphne Pallas. See Andrea Des, who is you know a Filipino writer living in the states, and um, you know it's very exciting to see the diversity um, of publishing grow. But 
at the same time, I can't help but notice what you said also, which is it tends to sometimes overlook that in between us, you know, we are not really off the state, but also not off somewhere else. And so where does your work fall? And um, I, w- I really wanted to kind of like lead into the idea of community as a writer with that. So you said that you have um, met other writers who are working in this space as well. So how do you meet other writers, you know? And I, I'll, I'll just contextualize why I'm asking this. I think that there's a good chance there are many writers or aspiring writers in our audience who maybe um, were very isolated in their writing. I know that I was certainly very isolated when I was growing up. I didn't know any writers. And uh, moving to the US, you know, there are writers everywhere, but mm-hmm. not, at, not when I was back home. So where do you meet these writers, you know? Ah, okay. There, there are two ways to answer that. Uh, meeting other writers, the pandemic has actually been one blessing um, mm-hmm. because nobody can actually travel. Ironically, I've been everywhere. Uh, I've, I've attended a lot of conferences online, virtual conferences, both as a participant and as a, and, and as a speaker. And it allows me to, to get in touch with people that I would have otherwise never met. Uh, things like FutureCon, uh, alternate future uh, in Brazil, alternate futures in, in Holland. They, they're very, oh, it's, it, especially if you're, if you're used to a Western setting, you should join them because they are, it's, a, it's, like, a, it's, like, a, it's like the federation in Star Trek. <laughs> you have literally people from different cultures that, that are joining this. And it's, it's a wonderful thing. Uh, I, I, I get to speak to somebody from Egypt or to Uganda, for example, being on the same panel, something that would never happen. Uh, my work, I don't think will ever bring me to Uganda. But it's so fascinating to meet uh, more than one person from, from, from there who actually writes in speculative fiction like I do. Um, that's, that's one way to answer it. The other way is I grew up uh, at the time when, the, when most of the writers were heavily influenced by the University of Iowa's MFA program. And unfortunately, that means that if, if you did not write anything that was not in a social realist vein, your work was basically ignored. So anything with a spaceship, anything with a ghost, anything that is vaguely speculative fiction, even magical realism was actually, you know, pulp fiction, essentially, mm-hmm. uh, to, 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 to a lot of the old hands at that time. And so I'm, and I struggled for years to actually get my stuff read, even just read by pe- people because there were no venues and nobody uh, and nobody seemed interested. So right now I actually reach out to a lot to students a lot. I actually I, I do a lot of workshops with kids uh, not just here in Singapore but but also elsewhere uh, because I want people like me not to get and, and not to have the idea that you're alone when you're writing that hey somebody out there wants to write about the weird, the strange, the unusual, about the future, about a secondary world. These are all natural. These are these are part of the writing practice, and it has a place. I love that. I um, so much of what you said really uh, resonated with me. I okay. So first up would be the conferences. I think. So did you kind of. Were you already invited to go speak at those conferences? Did you sign up when you were like a budding writer to see how it goes? You know, what was that like for you? Uh, well, I was lucky because uh, the first time around, I just showed up and introduced myself. I, I feel that nobody will really know you. And, you know, I, I'm thankfully I've got, I'm thick faced enough to, to, to realize that, hey, at worst, what's the worst that they can do? They will ignore me and they already ignore me because they don't know me. So. At least I will try. And it turns out that most writers uh, are actually very good and decent people. They're very welcome, they're, they're, especially of new writers. Uh, I, I heard of some horror stories, but the vast majority of writers that, that I have met were all very nice and they're very accommodating. Yeah. I was also very moved to hear about how you reach out to students who are up and coming because um, I do think that, you know, building that community moving forward especially for diaspora writers it's so it's so important because we don't have that existing structure the way you know writers mm-hmm. who have a firm you know established years and years and years of history to draw on have so that is that is so great and you know for what you were saying earlier about how 
as long as if, if you're not University of Iowa style writing, people don't read you. Your work is very literary, very. And I actually see a comment in the chat box which kind of links into this, so I'm just going to read it out. As you look back on your stories, do you find that they share common themes in addition, in addition to formal experimentation and a diaspora sensibility? Diaspora. Um, yeah, as, as, uh, apart from uh, being uh, talking about the diaspora and the issues that, that surrounding it, there are two very interesting uh, things that I, I think you will see in many of my stories. The, the twin concepts of infinity and death. Mm. They're there. there. Uh, it's, it's part of the questioning that I have myself. My mother died very early when I was, when, uh, and I was very young. And it's always made me wonder, uh, no, you don't exist before you're born and you don't exist after you die. What is actually there? Is there a meaning to all of that? Why, why, is, it, why is it the case? Why are there twin infinities bounding our very existence? And that's always been a question that, that has... Uh, uh, has entered my mind. And the thing is, when we are writers, one of the greatest things about writing any kind of fiction work at all, whether it is poetry or novels or, or science fiction or historical fiction or romance, this is seriously, if you're a writer, you are the god of your universe. You, 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 you create everything. Even a realist work is actually not real because you are abstracting and distilling your experience into something that, yes, nominally looks real, but it is an abstraction. And in which case, I want to use that abstraction to find out what lies beyond the veil. What is here? What does infinity mean? And I really think that infinity gives meaning to our limited existence here. Uh, and and these are this that's the constant theme I'm exploring in nearly every story in 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 the book. I also see that you know when you were talking about death as one of the long like you know long running themes, you also often wage it as a gamble. You know, like it's not just death; it's death as a gamble for something else. So you you know earlier we were talking about your story, I am the one in ten. In that one, the gamble is you are offered an excellent life as long as you are willing to die on demand basically which is a very political statement very you know especially coming from you know our part of the world and um in that story also many people like who are not the narrator but you know just observations of other people in that world are very willing to wipe their minds cleanly as part of the social contract so the social contracts within each story that you have are so strong um and, you know, earlier we were talking about that story you said was set in Singapore, um, big enough for the entire universe, which excellent story, one of my favorites. Thank she, you. Uh, she is willing to trade the whole world for her family, you know, that kind of gamble you're willing to, for everyone else to basically die, or I mean, not die, because later they get repurposed into techno-organic matter, but, you know, they are not the same. Um, but she's gambling a lot on that, on that, something that you know if you were standing outside of her experience you might not see it as logical or not see it as you might not understand why she does that so yeah i was hoping that we could talk about the equation of death the equation and gamble of death in your work well every day when you wake up you're actually gambling with death you never know uh, if an aneurysm will strike you or you will live a very long life. You don't know whether uh, a weirder form of COVID will come uh, or it will go away tomorrow. In a very real sense, it is always a gamble. Um, one of the things that struck me about living both in the West and in the East, I lived in the US as a kid, uh, actually, uh, in Houston, of all places. And, and, and the thing that, that strikes me is how fatalistic Asians are in comparison and how Americans, particularly Americans have this, no, I have a work hard enough, I will, I, I, will, I will find my destiny kind of thing. And in a sense, actually, since I come from in the middle, I kind of see it's kind of both. Sometimes even if you have like all the advantages in life, you may not have the luck and luck actually is, a, to me, is a real thing. It's not, it's not a superstitious kind of luck, but um, I work in cryptography. So there is always a random element in things. 
that random element that you absolutely cannot control. And to me, that is what luck is. And I, I want to illustrate that in the stories that, and sometimes the matter of life or death, the matter of success or failure is all down to that one point where you make a wager, I will do this instead of that. And it changes the equation. Yeah, but you know, in your equations, I sense a lot of hope. You know, even though it was just a kind of strange thing to say, because the situations you're presenting, honestly, are pretty depressing, you know, as with much fantastic science fiction that is. But, you know, the, the way you render it, the way you write, there is so much hope in it. And um, I kind of saw that in one of your stories. I actually wrote this down and I'm looking for it. But, um, hmm. Yes, I don't know where it went. It is on my very long word document, but never mind. I will come back to that later. No but yeah, I want to ask, as a writer, are you, do you feel that writing into, you know, this time where it's so, you know, it's been a struggle to be a writer, a diasporic writer, um, always a struggle, and the writing into a time when, you know, um, the world is, is, is getting more and more strange, um, sometimes not in great ways. So do you feel that, place into your work and you know how do you move forward as a writer and are you optimistic about things like that uh, absolutely i think that even in the most bleak of situations hope is never gone it is somewhere there and i think we're doing the world a disservice uh, unless you're paying un unless you're unless it's non-fiction and you're actually just report and doing reportage where there is a place for that i think as a writer we have an obligation to at least point out that there is a possibility of hope somewhere, that there is a small thin liner, no matter how thin that is somewhere in the bleakest of situations. One of, I love reading um, uh, dystopias, but I've got this problem that that seems to be all I read. There is no way out in some of the stories that I'm there. And what I would really like to read right now is, not a utopia, because it's still, utopias are actually dystopias disguised in a lot of stories. Brave oh, New yeah. World, a you know, classic example. Um, but I would like to read an anti-dystopia work. Something that is serious and yet has talks about hope. I guess the closest I can think of to that is certain parts of Star Trek uh, as opposed to Star Wars. I love both. But one of them is always, always, always hanging out to hope. And the other one is always, although always fighting the darkness, it always seems to be about darkness. And so no, I'm not, oh, sorry, go on. And so that's, that's something that, that I aim for. I, I think that it's a disservice to the, to the readers if you don't at least show them that, you know, it is not as bleak, no matter how dark it is, there's something there. It might be beyond your lifetime, but it's there. Yeah, I actually must confess, I have never watched Star Trek. I'm a Star Wars fan. Yeah. But now I, now I will, because um, this is the second time this week that somebody has referenced Star Trek to me. Um, so yeah, that's like, we can talk about where I should start later. But no I'm, I'm gonna, um, I see another question in the chat box that I'm just gonna float right now. Despite mm -hmm. language and other barriers, can we speak of a common Southeast Asian literary tradition the way we can to a certain extent of a European one? Can we see ourselves as Southeast Asian writers and what does it mean to say that? Actually, um, this is something that I, I, I try to, uh, I try to work out and articulate for myself all the time. Um, I've been lucky enough to be able to work in practically every Southeast Asian country and I see a lot of commonalities. Um, that are here. Yes, it is possible. And yes, it is there. Maybe not Raya and the Last Dragon possible, but it is there. Yeah. Um, there is a common heritage, even words that are common. The word Sayang exists in about six of the six of the 10 Southeast Asian countries that are here. It's in words itself. Uh, I can say something in Philippines. This is a white plate, ito pinggang puti. And somebody in Malaysia, Indonesia would understand me perfectly. Uh, apart from language, there is culture uh, and the, the shared environment means we have we also have a part of our history that is similar but more importantly the 
uh, with probably the sole exception of Thailand, we all share the idea of coming from colonial uh, occupation at some point. And that is the strongest thread that binds many of us together. We have a shared experience with colonizers of different kinds. Um, and it's not just Western colonization, like is the case for, for, say, a lot of countries in Africa or Latin America. We've also experienced colonization from Asian, fellow Asian countries. Um, Vietnam, for example, shares the fact, uh, um, shares with Laos the fact that China used to be, and Thailand also for a little bit was also colonized in part, uh, parts of it were about were invaded by, by China. And it's a constant issue right now in the South China Sea, for example. Um, this is things that, these are things that we actually all share in common and it just needs a group of people to basically articulate what this is, just like the Europeans have done. Yeah, I um, definitely think that the, the, the fact that all of our countries have come from a history, even though it may not have been within our specific lifetime, come from a history of having understood living under that kind of oppression or occupation. Um, Singapore also, as you know, has been occupied and colonized both by Asians and by British people. So um, that kind of like dynamic and trying to, it creates an interesting tension also, right? Because on one hand, you want to prove that you can move past that. But on the other hand, you want to reckon with the history and what it has left behind, like the legacy of living in an ex-colonial state. So, yeah. I mean, you know, earlier you were talking about, uh, you know, having community with other writers. So are, are these other, is your community of writers like primarily Southeast Asian writers? Like do you guys have these conversations about, you know, the Southeast Asian writer identity? Ironically, my first community of writers was actually Singaporean writers because I started actually writing in Singapore. And because of that, uh, that, that's where I started. And then it branched out to the Philippines later. And now it's actually really worldwide because I've been, um, because of the, not even before the pandemic came, the reality of you going around and meeting somebody that is like you is very small to start with. And when you find somebody that, 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 that you find interesting, you might not even share the same values, but there is a friendship that is worth keeping. You will reach out. It doesn't matter if you do it over Zoom or over email. And I've done that. Uh, my friends right now are literally everywhere around the world. And I have some that I hope actually are in New York City and attending this as well. Uh, and despite the distance, I, I, I think that anytime we can drop a note or a message and then we can talk we can talk about writing we can talk about personal stuff we can talk about star trek and things like that and it's it's uh, the pandemic has made has facilitated being able to talk to people from long distances like me now i'm here in singapore and you're all in the u.s yeah i will say that my main community of writers also was online you know i benefited greatly from just randomly DMing writers going, I like your work. Can we be friends? Half of them, you know, might have been a bit like, oh, who's this person in my inbox? But then, you know, most people are really nice. And you know what you said earlier about, um, you know, writers being really good, decent people. I, I think it, it has also been my experience. And I hope that any of the aspiring writers in the audience feels, you know, takes this as a sign to reach out to someone that they admire or want to build community with. In fact, um, yesterday a writer was just telling me about how the writing community and I would love to hear if you think this, this has been your experience as well the writing community is very um, pay it forward um, in terms of culture you know they are constantly looking out for younger up and coming like aspiring writers and um, that kind of like mentorship mentorship that isn't within a professional structure um, but it's more community based it, it seems to be quite prevalent in the writing community it is ab absolutely, especially in the speculative fiction writing community and in the smaller communities and experimental writing that 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 that, that I go with. Um, that said, you um, just like you don't have, uh, you need to be discerning when you have friends in real life. You just also need to know what you're getting into when you get into a, a, an online friendship with uh, with with other people. Um, that they are people. Let's start with that. And they have good things and bad things about them. So while generally everybody's friendly and great, you need to be able to 
judge people. Uh, not judge. That is the wrong word. You need to be <laughs> able to discern people's what what people want to do, or sometimes just have a layer of protection to know that they also have their own problems, they have their own issues, and, and that sometimes you just really come off in the wrong time uh, for this. So, And also there are predators. There are bad people. There are bad people that are there and we need to be careful about them. I have sadly been involved in at least, or peripherally at least in three or four of, of these bus stops. And so they do exist, but that should not, but they're actually a very minor part of it. As long as we are aware that not everybody is that nice, the general bot, like 95, 96% of people that you will approach generally are, they're generally nurturing and they want to help. Yeah, I um, would love to talk more with you about that after this. So I also wanted to put out a small announcement that after this event ends, we are still gonna hang around a little bit. So. You know, you can, after the official end of this event, you guys can stay back and chat with G or Victor if you have any questions for them, or if you want to have any, like, ask any, you know, if you want to just chat with them, we're all going to be hanging out for a little bit after this. But um, thank you so much for sharing that, Victor. I also wanted to um, bring it back to your book and talk a little bit about, um, you know, earlier we were talking about the idea of death and uh, twin infinities. But I also noticed that in many of your stories, death is just not the end. So you have a story, Panopticon, where we Panopticon, see characters, yeah. yeah, characters being downloaded and we see in memoriam programs running and we can also see how an afterlife can be built if you've got enough money. So even though this sounds kind of amazing, um, <laughs> later in the story, we realize that the main character is, spoiler alert, trapped in some kind of weird revenge afterlife created by an ex-student yeah. that he slept and had a child with. Yes. So, you know, she's rich enough now to revive him and trap him in this afterlife, but this really felt like a Me Too revenge story um, within a sci-fi universe. And I really wanted to ask how your daily politics come into play with your speculative fiction writing. Oh, I'm very bad. My politics seeps into my writing all the time. <laughs> I can't help it. I mean, uh, it, is, it is my platform and, and I do have an audience and... Uh, and it is the best way for me to come across. Uh, you know what? We all have, maybe if we're lucky, we live 70, 80, 90, 100 years. My writing is the only way I can tell people about what my beliefs are long after I'm gone. Long after any of us are gone. When you write something, that's the only thing of us that exists. But not in my stories, but definitely in the real world, that is, that is the case. Yeah. You know, I see that in your collections. So even though, you know, your collection is called The Infinite Library and other stories, there is no story called The Infinite Library. Um, yes. And that seems to call into the idea of this superstructure of a library that kind of um, constructs your entire universe within the walls of this book. And, you know, when you said, you know, you want your fiction to stay before, stay when long after you're gone, this happens all the time in your collection. Something that happens in one story pops up millennia or universes later in another story and, and I, I love reading these Easter eggs and you know um, I, I want to be like conscious of time so later I'm going to ask you about how you structured that um, you know if people want to hang around and listen to it after that I would love to but um, I also wanted to ask you about the concept of infinity as a writer because you know clearly the infinite library is an illusion to Boris and um, that short story uh, you know, starts with sentence, the universe, which others call the library, and the interchangeably, interchangeability of a library as a whole universe, again, it, it's so much, so much, you know, so what am I saying? It is so related <laughs> to what you are writing as a writer. And, um, you know, you've created this library that's not just any library, it's a library of infinite potential, which you are kind of explicitly state a few times. Um, you know, you can find any book in here and it creates this drive for discovery since technically um, you can find anything you desire in there you, you just may not know how to start looking so um you know in the original Borges short story that this turned into a drive for destruction um mm. but what about for you you know because i don't you we have already spoken about this earlier but you are fundamentally hopeful as a writer so how did you manage the dimensions of this infinite conflict in the way you crafted this collection? I, yeah, uh, Borges is, is one of my favorite writers and that, that comes off uh, from, my, from reading uh, 
any number of stories that I have that, that very clearly I, I, I shows up in your collection, yeah. right? Yeah, he even shows up, yeah, in the collection itself, yeah. Uh, and um, but I think that infinity, by definition, includes hope. It, it includes the possibility of hope. Both of them are different, actually, but related. And because that is the case, it can never be bleak. It can never be as bleak. And that's the thing also, in, in a way, it's, it's how I think that there's something that survives us after death, even if I myself am not a religious person, because infinity contains all possibilities. And there is always that possibility that something comes after. And it's simply that, it's a mathematical thing for me. It's not even a religious belief. I love that. Um, you know, when you were talking about that I was just remembering that earlier in our conversation when you said you want to read something hopeful, um, I actually wanted to bring this up and then I kind of got sidetracked by Star Trek. But there is this short story by Ursula K. Le Guin, which I recently reread, but which I read like every year, you know, the ones who walk away from homeless. And I oh, feel like yes. that is a hopeful story because they walk away. So to me, I mean, obviously you're familiar with this story already, but um, I, love her, I love her work. Yeah, I love, love, love her work. And I just kind of feel like that it's like really fundamentally a hopeful worldview that there is a way to opt out of the social contract if you are willing to take that step, you know. Um, I, I was born into a dictatorship and somehow we got ourselves out of it and somehow we brought ourselves back into it and I'm living in, an, in, in a state that is borderline authoritarian. So... But at the same time, this state is not the same as the one I came from. There are better things about living in Singapore than it was living under Marcos Ira Manila. Much, much better things. And so what the things that are here is that I think sometimes people don't realize that there are shades of gray that are there. And there's never anything so black and white. Um, with every... With every thesis, there is an antithesis, but eventually there comes a synthesis. And of course, another time that comes with its own antithesis. But the whole point is that it's circular. It moves forward. It is not static. And what may be bad right now may be not so bad or better, or it can be absolutely, totally worse, but it doesn't end there. That's, that's the whole point of infinity. It doesn't end there. And it shouldn't. And that's why hopeful stories are great. And that's actually, for me, reflects reality more. At what? least that's my personal opinion. What are you working on right now as a writer? Ah, uh, uh, okay. So I com just completed a screenplay that was based on a short story that's coming out at the end of the year. It's unfortunately not in the collection. This is a new cycle of stories. Um, so you remember, remember uh, I'm the one in ten is actually set in Singapore. Yeah. And I, I, I wanted to, to take that idea. Yeah, believe it or not, it's actually set in Singapore. Yeah. Hey. Not the new, the new cities in Singapore? Ah, uh, yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's, an, it's, a, it's, a, it's a story about migration. If you read really closely. And uh, you choose the uh, places that, that only let in uh, by merit. You are the smartest. You are the best. You are the most athletic. You are the most period you can get in. So... Read that what you will. But anyway, read into that what you will. But in my story, what if you have a government that decides that uh, I'm going to make this social contract with you, Gemma? I have a way that I can, uh, that you surrender your consciousness to me for nine, at nine to five. And I'm a paternalistic government. I will take care of you. I will make sure you're super healthy and you will be doing the best possible work that you can do. You never have to worry about you never have to worry about uh, making sure that, that, that you, there are no politics at work. Everything's done super efficiently. Would you do it? Would you give up your nine to five? Because at the end of it, you come out from work and you're, you're free to do anything that you want. It's totally, you're not worried about salary. You're not worried about uh, career development. You're not worried about, the only thing is you don't remember what happens for that nine to five period. They give you tapes, you can view what you did and a strict NDA never to share. Would you do it? Would you take that, would you take that uh, wager? 
Well, Victor, you know, if this conversation is recorded and going on YouTube, I feel like we should have this. I should I should answer that separately. You know, we would just hang okay. out later and you yeah. know talk about Star Trek and talk about social contracts and talk about government. I will, okay, I will tell you something scary. So I actually wrote one story from there, and it got published. Uh, um, this as if we could dream forever, and when I sh- I, I really meant it as a horror story. Mm-hmm. The, the, and then what scared me was when it came out. I had a lot of people tell me I wish this were real, which was the exact opposite of what I thought people would say. I thought they would be scared, but no. A lot of people were saying, "You know what? I wish that was the case. That I don't have to worry. I don't. I, we don't have to worry about my job. I don't have to worry about uh, about what I do. I don't have to worry about office politics. I don't have to worry about being healthy and maintaining my weight and stuff like that." And that was exact, literally the exact opposite uh, thing that I have. So it, it's a horror for me, not a horror for them, apparently. And so I'm exploring that theme and, and I'm turning it into a whole other cycle of stories. And I recently finished a screenplay about, uh, about one such story. Um, social contracts. And again, the concept of if you are here, that means there's an AI running your life and you're actually uploaded there. You actually can exist forever. And in one story there, one guy actually visits a toilet all the time. And you're wondering why. It's because the mom was a cleaner. And to support her family into the future, she gave up her, uh, her mental patterns to run the toilets in there because she was a toilet cleaner. And forever, she's running the toilets there. She's long dead, but she's still providing for her family. And that's all, all, all she wanted. And so uh, her son keeps coming back every time to that building to use the toilets because it's the only way he can be close to his mom what's long gone. Victor, it's 9.18 p.m. in New York. Don't make me cry with your, you know. You know, I thought we were just going to talk about speculative fiction and then you pulled on the mother-son heartstring and now I'm all teary-eyed. See, it's not black and white. And there are people who are willing to make that social contract because of the situation that they're there, that they're in specifically. It honestly does not surprise me what you said about people coming to you and saying they wish that that was real life. I see it play out all the time, all the time. As you know, um, very many countries in Asia are, you know, premised on social contracts, very attractive social contracts. And so you know, um, it does not surprise me. Well, I, I want to be really, really conscious of time because we have gone on for quite a while and um, I know that we can still hang out after this and continue talking, but um, I do also want to let people get the chance to get in on like chit-chatting with you after this as well. So I'm going to bring the event to an official close uh, and thank everyone involved here to, you know, everybody involved in making this possible. Thank G and the Cody Boy team, thank Monique and the readers and the winners and thank Victor, obviously, for, you know, your wonderful work and also your time here tonight. And I really want to wish you and your book all the success in the whole world. And success, not just in a commercial sense, but in the sense that people read and engage meaningfully and understand what you are saying and where you're coming from and they get touched in their lives. And I, yeah, I'm so glad to have been able to have this conversation with you. Once again, you know, guys, if you guys want to read Victor's work, the link to buy the book is in the chat box. Ah, there we go. Yes. So, you know, please purchase the North American edition of the Infinite Library and Other Stories by Victor Fernando R. O. Campo from the singaporeunbound.org page published by Gaudy Boy. Thank you so much, G, for Thank having you. me. Thank you. And I will see you guys next time.